Grüß Sie from Vienna, Austria. Welcome to Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classicism while enjoying one of Vienna's delicious cakes. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. Today, we are talking about the life of one of my favorite composers, Joseph Haydn. This is part one of a two-part series. My guest is Alexander Krakhofer, a historian who shares his knowledge as a culture ambassador for the city of Vienna. He works at the Haydn Birth House in Rohrau, Austria. Alexander, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Daniel, for having me. So you mentioned in an email that your ancestors had a special tie to the Haydn family. Yes, that's true, because my family has been around uh, in the little rural town of Rohrau for hundreds of years, basically. And, yeah, it's a coincidence, but I uh, could find out they were next-door neighbors to the Haydn family. Wow, that's great. It's just a proof of how history comes alive here. It's something that's not just in a book. Yes, in Austria you basically have history, and history places always are tied closely together. So uh, it's true, you find it everywhere. Just turn a stone. <laughs> yeah. So very appropriately, today's cake is Esterhazy Schnitte, which is named after the aristocratic Esterhazy family, whom Haydn served as court composer for almost 30 years. Prince Nicholas Esterhazy's support of the arts gave Haydn the freedom to experiment, which aided in Haydn's numerous musical innovations. This delicious cake consists of a yellow buttercream, spiced either with cognac or vanilla, between four or five thin layers of almond meringue dough, and is completely covered by a white sugar fondant glaze and decorated with a distinctive chocolate-striped pattern. It is personally one of my favorite cakes in Vienna. So, let's and dig Daniel, in. And Daniel, it looks really delicious <laughs> on the plate. Let's dig in. First, let's start in the year 1732 in the humble Austrian village of Rohrau, Haydn's birthplace. It was about a six-hour carriage ride outside of Vienna. Today, by car, it takes about 45 minutes. Haydn recalled later in his life that his childhood home was very musical. In what ways did growing up in a musical home shake the young Haydn? Well, I guess, uh, like every child, you will always remember the lullabies you hear as yeah, as a child, basically. And of course, in times before television, before radio, before electricity even, you had to make your own entertainment, and this was house music. When he was seven years old, Haydn was introduced to Georg von Reuter, the director of the famous Vienna Boys Choir, and joined the next year. What was Haydn's life like in the Vienna Boys Choir? Well, in the Vienna Boys Choir, you can uh, imagine, in that time, a choir combinated with a school, it was quite formal. They had not only to learn music and uh, singing all the theoretical parts you need to be in a good choir of a quality that would even approve, find a proof for the imperial family of that time. They were also kept strict in order, like is now in boarding schools or like that, you can imagine. Yeah, sure. And of course the Vienna Boys Choir is still around today and still uh, famous around the world. So. What are the differences between what Haydn's experience would have been compared to the current singer Knaben? Today, it's absolutely international. You have their children, boys from all around the world, and they're also traveling all around the world to spread their amazing music and art. Yeah. I've also read during this time that uh, Haydn was scantily fed. Well, yes, I can guess so. Well, the coin stayed with the teachers and the people in charge, not so much with the boys. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just that boys are never satisfied with how much food they get? Yeah, growing up boys are always hungry, come on, <laughs> just a fact. Yeah, I've read that Haydn and the fellow choristers would be inspired or, or motivated to sing better so that they would get invited to aristocratic homes to sing where they would, of course, have been served hors d'oeuvres. Yes, that's for sure true, because having a nice meal for the boys would have been an interesting yeah, way to improve their singing. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Haydn was quite renowned for his voice, was he not? 
Yes, he had a good voice, as you can read in old books or manuscripts. Probably this was his first talent, as uh, when Mr. Reuter met Haydn and found out he was to be fit for the boys' choir. So definitely, yes. And by the way, not very much known, there was a third Haydn brother next to Joseph and Michael, uh, who was going by the nom name Johann Baptist, who became a professional singer. Really? Yes. Wow. He's that... always forgotten in history, so, uh, mm. yeah. Oh, very interesting. And I to make, Thank you. to mention him. Yeah, because I know that Michael Haydn was also in the boys' choir. Yes. And in, in, in outshone Haydn in many ways sometimes. Uh, Josef Haydn, that is, but I'd never heard of this Johann Baptist Haydn. Yes, it's true. Yeah, there is not much known about him, uh, only that he landed, so to speak, also in Eisenstadt, where oh. he sang in the church uh, under supervision of his brother. And oh, you mentioned Michael Haydn being in uh, the boys' choir too. Yes, there is also a very nice little story when, uh, because Joseph was much older. So they had a kind of tutoring system in the boys' choir. And so it happens that the older brother, Joseph, became a tutor for his younger brother, of which he was very, very proud. So later in his teenage years, Haydn was expelled from the Vienna boys' choir. Why? Well, there were two basic reasons, or three, I could say. Well, first one, Haydn not only liked to joke around, he was kind of a real prankster. So he tried to play, well, sometimes quite bad jokes on his uh, fellows at school, like, yeah, cutting off the hair of other boys when they sat in school so they could not go public for like three months until the hair grew back or other things. And then there was this little thing happening. It was at uh, St. Leopold's Feast, which is like the local saint for uh, Lower Austria, and there was to be the festival in uh, in a monastery where also Maria Theresa, the Empress, would be. And well, Haydn was around six and a half years, seventeen years old, and the Empress just noted, "Oh, this Haydn, he was good before, but now he sings like a rooster." <laughs> and yeah, whatever the Empress says. You can imagine yeah. the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Haydn was um, officially expelled and caned, it said, for cutting the pigtails off. But as you have told us, there's always more to the story. Yes. So after Haydn's expulsion from the Vienna Boys Choir, Haydn didn't even have a place to sleep. How did he go from rags to court composer? Well, that would be... A long story if we'd go into the details, but after he was expelled, he met a tenor singer named Johann Mist Michael Spangler, who just gave him a roof over his head. Hmm. Probably he met the boy hanging around somewhere here in the first district of Vienna, and I guess he knew him before, and said, oh, just come on, Joseph, you can stay at my place. And it happens because, yeah, it said Joseph Haydn was not only a person who was always friendly, but he knew how to behave. So there was never like a problem of behavior when he was in a good company, so to say. And the second man who helped him was a man called Mr. Buchholz. And he gave him like a little credit of around about 100 60 gulden, which was quite a lot of money, and this enabled uh, young Haydn to rent the apartment at Michaela House in the first district here in the old city center. Well, the apartment was not too good, so to say, because, yeah, in the summertime it was tremendously hot because it was just beneath the roof. In the middle of the year it just rained through when it was raining through the roof. And, yeah, in the winter time it was terribly cold. But the house was quite interesting because now we would come to a place that saw, well, fascinating people living in it. You had Nicola Porpora, and uh, you also had an old count, an old duchess, Esterhazy. Well, there we have the first connection between the Esterhazys and Haydn, even if it was just meeting at the staircase. Wow. Yeah. So what I like about Haydn in this time 
what I find particularly inspiring is his determination and desire to be who he who he felt he was to be a composer, and the fact that he uh, in this era practically taught himself composition. Mainly, yes, he said Haydn was like self-taught. Uh, to a certain degree, that's true. But living in a house with Mr. Metastasio and Mr. Popora, I could find out he had lessons together with these masters, while he also gave lessons in music himself. This was very important for Haydn's upcoming as a musician. He could learn really a lot because these old musicians were like in their 60s and 70s when he met them first. So they had had their career and, well, they saw the potential in the young man. At this point, Haydn slowly climbed the social ladder, so to speak, and, and mm -hmm. got better and better patronage and better and better students and better and better positions. And he felt that it was about time that a man of his station fall in love with somebody and get married. Yes, that's true. And so he did find this person, but she chose to be a nun. So instead, he married her sister, Maria Anna. Now, I'm sure that worked out well. So how would you describe their marriage? The uh, marriage of Haydn, well, they married actually at St. Stephen's Cathedral here in Vienna, was not happy at all, I'd say, because sadly, his wife she had no interest in music at all. Even, well, as we can read, she tended to take away his notes and his music papers and use them for baking cakes. <laughs> so, when you love music and you're a musician, you can understand that's terrible. <laughs> you can't do this. When Haydn was 29 years old, he was appointed vice court composer by Prince Anton Esterhazy. Mm -hmm. Prince Anton quickly died the next year, so Haydn worked for Prince Nicholas Esterhazy, whose patronage of the arts sparked a golden age for Haydn's creative output. And the Esterhazy court split their time between the palace in Eisenstadt and the extremely remote Esterhazy. And so, can you describe these two places and how they affected Haydn's life and work? Yes, I might add, it was not only these two places, because they also had a palais in the city center. So, for the first years of his job with the Esterhazys, Haydn came to Vienna very regularly. So, he was not cut out from what happened in this city. So. Esterhaza and, of course, the palace in Eisenstadt, they're quite interesting because, you know, the structure of the places back then was like you imagine it would have been. You had the nobleman who ruled everything, who basically owned all the land around, and all the people who worked directly for him were to be his servants. And so was young Haydn. He was a servant to the to the Prince of Esterhazy, but on the other hand, he was also considered an officer of the household, which gave him a good status. So traveling not only around with the prince, he was also in charge of the princely orchestra and much more. So he had to provide the music the prince required for his parties, which he of course gave at Esterhazy Palace and so they were driving around in carriages. And that's one thing I love when uh, you listen to Haydn's music. You can basically hear that. The inspiration Haydn got out of the landscape. When you know the Burgenland and Northern Hungary area, you, when you see the landscape during the year and you have the music of Haydn somehow in the back of your head, you will understand much more what inspired this great musician. Yeah. One of the defining things I think about this time during Haydn's life was this sense of isolation that he felt. And you mentioned that in the early years that he spent quite a lot of time in Vienna, but that became less and less. Is that true? That's true, absolutely. Because the life of the Esterhazy court, it got more and more centered at Esterhazy Palace. 
And this is quite far away from Vienna, especially uh, back in those days. Not only that, but there were big projects for Haydn to do for the Prince Esterhazy. And so there's a quote from Haydn at this time to talk about him lamenting his isolation. He said, I was cut off from the world. There was no one to confuse or torment me, and I was forced to become original. Yes, that's one of my favorite quotes. Yeah. And original, yes, he was only original because yeah, Haydn had this kind of wit and also humor. You can, you can feel it in his compositions when you hear the music. And originally not only means to be cut off from like the rest of the world, but to follow your own way, to follow what you believe in, to do the kind of music and to create the expression you want the world to have from you. And he had access to this orchestra, which he says allowed him to experiment endlessly, which one can imagine as a composer to have an orchestra at your disposal means that, and, and to have nothing but time on your hands is a pretty conducive environment to how we get over a hundred symphonies and a hundred string quartets and 60 piano sonatas and etc. Definitely. <laughs> and that's just what we know. There is probably a lot more to find of Haydn's composition, especially the early ones, which are just somewhere in some archives, yeah. just hidden still. This wit and humor is something that permeates his whole life. His yes. character, his music, with wit and humor, there is also a cleverness in there. Definitely. He had a highly social intelligence. So he was a man who knew how the people listening to his music at concerts, he exactly knew them and they, he knew how they would react to what he did. Mm -hmm. So he could play with them yeah. and enjoyed it. And the farewell symphony being that Prince Nicholas was enjoying an extended stay at his, was supposed to be his summer palace in Eshterhaza, but which he preferred to stay at for much longer periods of time. And a side effect of this was his whole court and his whole orchestra went with him, but they weren't allowed to bring their families, yes. and their wives and their children. And after a number of months away, the, the musicians naturally start missing and desiring to be with their family. And so they came to Hyde and asked him to work his magic. And he writes, comes out with this farewell symphony, which is in the last movement. Slowly the orchestra members extinguish the candle on the stand and walk off the stage. And as it goes, the Prince Nicholas got the hint and said, okay, we'll pack up and we'll go back to Eisenstadt. Yes, this is kind of a musical petition, I put it, because, yeah, they could not address the prince like, oh, sir, we please, we want to go to our family. So they had to find the more intelligent way. Uh, more or less, Haydn had to find for all of them, and it pretty well worked. Yeah. You know, I see this sort of recreated on modern concert stages when orchestras will say, well, I will do the farewell symphony and it'll be a good joke. And as they turn off the lights or whatever, they, they walk away and leave, they snicker and the audience snickers. But I don't think it would have been this way. I don't think it would have been a funny joke. I think Haydn was seriously trying to say the musicians missed their family. This is a solemn thing. Definitely. And all the musicians on their note holders, they had a, a, one or two candles. And when they left the concert, it said they just blew out the candle. So it got darker and darker in the room, which was also like symbolic, visually. Yeah. So another story we talked earlier about Haydn's you know, tenuous relationship with his wife, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And so there came a soprano to Eshterhaza by the name of Polzelli, mm -hmm. and whom Haydn took quite a liking to. Yes, this young lady, uh, well, it, it caught the eye of, of Haydn. One thing we definitely know about Haydn, he may not have loved his wife much, but he loved the woman in general. So there are a lot of rumors of a Mr. Haydn sneaking around and having little, little affairs showing how much influence he had on the, the princely household, being that Luigia Pozzelli and her husband were both subpar musicians, and, and Prince Nicholas was not happy with them, and was planning to you know get rid of their contracts and say they have to leave. And when it came to Prince Nicholas's attention that 
his esteemed court composer had taken a liking to the soprano, he says to himself, well, sometimes perhaps we have to make some exceptions for the general happiness of the household. Definitely. <laughs> and, well, the story continues two generations of Princess Estahasi later. Well, a letter arrived from Italy, and this letter is asking for a kind of a little pension or money. Well, it's signed with the granddaughter of Joseph Haydn. So this little affair with Miss Pozzelli, I guess, had produced an offspring. <laughs> and this would be the only known offspring of Haydn, which in his marriage had no children. Right. Yeah, very interesting. There is one relationship that Haydn made during this time that is of special interest, and that is the friendship with Mozart. What were the dynamics between these two men? Well, first, well, probably uh, people listening know Mozart was way younger than Haydn, and they met in uh, Vienna around 1781, it said, and this was when Haydn, as kind of a guest, attended a concert where Mozart was playing here in Vienna, and uh, he saw the potential he heard, as they say, this angelic, this unique sound Mozart, even when he was a young man, he could produce what he gave to the world. And sure, they became friends, not only like friends, like people you know, they became like close friends. There is something like heart throbbing. After Mozart had passed away, Mozart's wife, Constanze, she said, well, Haydn, he was... Wolfgang's best friend mm. and yeah she would have known definitely yeah. wow. Wow. and so these two men had great respect for each other and their yes. work well they did write letters to each other because Mozart living in Vienna Haydn uh, staying most of his time in Esterhaza or Schloss in Eisenstadt when Haydn had invented the string quartet Mozart he composed uh, some quartets himself he sent them to Haydn and he said, my dear friend, I humbly send you my tryings in creating what you have invented so gloriously and please let me know if it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And this came from Mozart. So, yeah, Mozart, he kind of also was a, a humble personality, even if he is always pictured quite bubbly and... and yeah, he was he was quite bubbly and fresh, but with his friends he could be very serious. And also they were close because sometimes in the letters when you get to see like pictures or the originals, it's like me carissimo, though he writes my friend from the bottom of my heart as introduction and this says a lot about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And one thing which is mentioned not too much in the books, but is both Mozart and Haydn, of course, they were Freemasons, mm -hmm. and they were in the same loge here in Vienna. And to illustrate sort of the humility that these two men had, you know, in their friendship and in the lack of jealousy thereof, uh, the famous quote that Haydn says to Leopold about his son Mozart being that, before God and as an honest man, I tell you that your son is the greatest composer known to me either in person or by name. He has taste and furthermore, the most profound knowledge of composition. There is nothing more to say on Mozart because it comes from Haydn directly. Haydn wanted to give his appreciation he felt for his friend Wolfgang also to the father who he knew from Mozart directly had always been too strict and said, you have to become better Wolfgang. And come on, did Wolfgang Mozart need to become more better than he was? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> no, I suppose not. Please join us for part two of this podcast to learn why Beethoven and Haydn had a rocky relationship, how Haydn was celebrated and honored during two trips to London, and the shocking 145-year journey to his final resting place. Thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Classical Cake. 
Visit classicalcake.com for more episodes and exclusive content relating to Viennese classical music and culture. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen.